Welcome uh, to our very first community event here in our make space in Berlin at Mediale Farbe. And uh, it's incredible that for the very first time that we're having an, um, an event here uh, in our make space talking about make spaces mm -hmm. and uh, having a wonderful guest here, Erika Tiga from Guatemala. Um, before we start, uh, since we're a small group and we're actually expecting one more participant, uh, we uh, I'm just going to introduce myself quickly and uh, the space we're in, the topic we're discussing today, and uh, then I would say we'll just have a very short uh, round of introduction so we know each other's names, and uh, then we're going to start with our discussion. So um, we're here in Berlin in the mix space of Mediale Fabel, which is a space that we opened about eight, year, eight months ago um, with the idea of creating a hub and a space where uh, not only we can brainstorm ideas, but also use techniques of digital fabrication and making in order to transcend into our community and um, bring ideas that are fabricated here and experienced here into our community and uh, find out what could happen in a space that is both physical but also digital, since we have many different um, technical equipment that allows us to, for example, connect internationally and hybrid, in, in a hybrid way and in the way we do right now. Um, so it's our first event and the idea is that uh, we're going to have periodically community events where we invite people to come here to the space, but also connect with people around the world and discuss um, issues that we're having about making and critical making and uh, media education, political education, and basically all the things that, are we, that we're concerned about. Um, today's topic, um, and that's something we want, we want to start talking about make spaces and what the potential of make spaces are uh, for communities. And uh, we thought, well, we have a make space and we're trying things out, but it would be so much more interesting to listen to people that have actually much more experience in building up a make space and uh, using a make space uh, to do incredible things. And that's why I'm very happy to um, welcome Erika Tiga from Guatemala. An old friend of mine, we used to work together um, many years ago at Colegio Interamerica. And uh, she built a make space and made that dream come true. So I'm super happy that you were able to join us here today and uh, that we can learn from you and uh, that you can show us a little bit what you have done in the past years, uh, how you're using the make space to enhance the community and what the ideas are that are being created there. And then hopefully we're going to be we're going to have a discussion about how we can use these spaces to um, transform communities. My name is Erika. I am from Guatemala and I represent today uh, a community of makers here in Guatemala. We're building one. We started five years ago and this project that I'm going to show you today wasn't done by myself. It was a collaboration between a lot of people. Uh, and yeah, I work at, uh, at a school here in Guatemala. It's called Colegio Interamericano, but we also like have projects outside of school involving maker spaces and maker mindsets. So I hope we, we get to know each other in this experience. Okay, so today we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, how not only to implement a maker space, but making it meaningful uh, for the strength of your community and I have to say at the beginning, we started with a very blurry vision that started to become clearer and clearer with the time. So I'm gonna start with one quote that I like that says, a makerspace is a coalition of art, technology, learning and collaboration. It's not just a space with physical tools or digital tools. We have to see it as that crash, as that explosion and explosions are messy. And if we understand that, uh, we start giving room to creativity and to creation uh, itself. It doesn't have to be one set of steps, very rigorous that we have to follow. Things need to be very fluid and we need to be comfortable with that uh, uncertainty and mess. 
So uh, that's something that I have learned. And if that's the only thing you get from today's uh, presentation, that'll be, uh, I'll be, I'll be happy with it. So I'm going to show you two of my favorite clips. Okay. In the first one that I'm going to show you, we have kids from uh, second and third grade will be uh, eight, seven, and eight years old. And they were learning about simple machines and they found a way to be disruptive with that. So let's see. So yeah, they they started like showing how it worked, the pulley, and then hitting somebody else in the head with it. That's that's what kids do. And then let's let's check this other one. This is high school. Just for a little bit of context, they are working on a mechanical uh, pottery wheel. And uh, because we're doing a Mayan project and, and we want to do everything accessible for the schools in the countryside. And it happened, it, it works, the pottery wheel works, but the person was getting very tired because if you're like using the bike while somebody is, is doing some art and that person takes its time, I mean, it's a lot of exercise. So they started experimenting with uh, physics concepts, flywheels and momentum, and deciding where could they have changed the mechanism for the person just to give one impulse and the bike work it, leave the bike working by itself instead of one person just biking all the time. So it's the type of experiments they do. Uh, these videos have a lot of meaning for me because these were like the exact times where they had an aha moment and I was recorded, which doesn't happen very often. Yeah, so I'm gonna go to the next slide. So when you think about a makerspace, I'm not gonna go over this slide because I think we already know what a makerspace is unless somebody wants to, everybody knows what a makerspace is here, right? We, we I mean, you are in one, I'm in one. So I think we, we're good and you have a fab lab. Uh, so it's, it's great. Uh, we started thinking with the learning dimensions of making and tinkering. These five learning dimensions are our strong bridges where we walk to uh, define the idea of a makerspace and everything we do here, we do it related to these learning dimensions. The initiative, problem solving, uh, creativity, conceptual understanding, and social emotional engagement. Uh, why are we so tied to education first because this is a school and second because we believe that a maker education is one of the strongest ways for kids to apply what they're learning and if they can uh, i would i was i was telling my colleagues like i will add one more thing to the maslow hierarchy uh, of, of learning where instead of just reflecting of it if they can make something with it even if they are what they are making it doesn't work at the first time, that means they're applying the full learning. These are some examples of the things uh, they have been working on. Uh, you see kids working with 3D software, uh, colors, paints. This is a flying backpack where we're learning about superheroes. Uh, and it was very interesting because the unit was a nonfiction unit. And if you are teaching nonfiction, it can get very boring if you're teaching in elementary school, but uh, these teachers figure out a way to make their unit about superheroes and explaining the science behind each superpower. So they made a fiction topic, a non-fiction unit, and it was, it was amazing. So these are the steps for a successful design of a meaningful makerspace. First, we start with the needs of the space. Then we choose which frameworks or protocols are we gonna uh, align with when we're teaching and when we're using it. Then we go straight to the planning and design. We do the funding. I hear there's a person ex expert in funding here, so let's be friends. Then uh, we have the implementation and execution and the feedback that's very important. Uh, what happens in a lot of maker spaces that don't roll or that don't work? People start with the planning and design without having uh, an in-depth study of the needs or without having a framework to work with. Uh, it's not just about creating a space. You need to know uh, there are like a lot of different methodologies or frameworks that you can use to guide everything that's gonna happen in your space. 
if you don't find one that applies to your institution, you can create one by creating your mission and vision and what's gonna be your approach. But if you don't have that and you just start planning and designing, uh, it's gonna be like a fun activity, but then it's gonna fall uh, apart because it doesn't have like the connecting glue to tie it together. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the next slide. So when we started talking about the needs, just give me a minute, just give me a minute. Sorry, I had a, I had a teacher that was uh, here <laughs> with with kids. They're using one of the screens where they're talking very loud. I think they didn't see me because there's no respect here. I'm just kidding. No, I mean this is everybody's space. Everybody can come in and do whatever they want. I just uh, <laughs> okay. So um, these are the needs, and this is how it started. We were in need of integrating the maker concept to our technology classes. We had classes of technology where, where students were just learning about, let's say, uh, one program, PowerPoint, and they were not really using it for, for their learning and for the real world. So we kind of changed that. And this what I'm show, this is what I'm going to show you. It's a, a work that was done in 2018, 2018, 2019. It was desktop work. It was sitting on my desk and researching. I contact the universities where our alumni went and I asked them like, what digital skills are you asking from our students? What uh, needs do you see? What, what would you like to receive? And then I compiled them on. I'm gonna show you how it looks like. Uh, this is the extended map. But if you see here, I have, uh, once I got all those skills, I mapped them in five different strands and those strands are connected to the one I showed before. And then uh, once you map them, we develop the understandings, the standards, and I connected them to the international standards of technology because every, every country, most of, most of the countries have their standards, the technology standards. So we have ISDE for United States, we have the ones from the European Union, we have ones from ICDL in Asia. So I get them all, I gather and I, I classify them. So here is where you can see the extended map. For each of the strands, I uh, decided which of the standards apply to our need, to our skill. So if you scroll down, you can see which standards and then some understandings, essential questions. This is gonna be, I'm gonna share this with, with Katy so she can uh, share if you want to explore it a little bit more. And I did that for all the skills. So now we know what we're doing, okay? It's not that we are, uh, let's say, let's go to physical technology. It's not that we're just using devices and physical, te and physical tech, robotics, right? No, we are developing empowered learners we are developing digital citizens. We are developing creative communicators because that's what the standard is. So it's not just them using a 3D printer because they want to use the 3D printer. It's because of the skills we want to develop in them that they're using. So if you have this first umbrella, it makes sense for the learning and then you can connect it with everything. This, as you can see, is different than like the regular curriculums that we see in schools that have like, in March 10, you're gonna learn this. In March 11, you're gonna learn that because this is not a temporary curriculum with, uh, with a temporary line. This is uh, like a deck of cards. So I can meet with uh, my sister who's a math teacher and I can say like, okay, what you're learning? And she'd be like, okay, I'm, I'm teaching area and perimeter. And then I can get my deck of cards and I say like, oh, I have 3D design here. I want them to understand that. So we can work together, we can collaborate. This is in the concept of school. Outside of school, we can do the same thing. So what is your need? And that's one of the projects we're doing right now. What is your need? Oh, I want to uh, spread the cultural heritage of Guatemala. Oh, I have space for that and I have platforms, I have tools, so let's work together. But once I know what I have and what I want to develop because a collaboration needs to benefit both sides. So this is, uh, this is how we started. Once, and I, and I use a lot of the green here because the physical technology one, all of them are related to FabLab, to our makerspace, but the physical technology was the one that I used, again, for the funding that I went to the board and I said, 
we are in need of developing these skills. We need the space, we need the equipment, but after I knew the needs. So, um, <clears throat> so these are the ones I, I used, as you can see, CSCA of computer science teachers, common sense, which is global. This is Asia, Europe, uh, United States, and then I have a couple of more. This, uh, I'm telling you, this was done in 2018, 2019. It's, I have in my um, objectives or goals to revise it next year because it's been five years. So we're revising it and we're designing it again, but now with what we have. Um, we also have other frameworks like design thinking, engineering process, visible thinking, project-based learning, but those are more uh, abroad. Those are processes that are famous that, uh, that you can use for different projects, but you need your own, you need your own curriculum, you need your own mission and vision for your space. And you can let that guide everything you do. How does that help me now? Because there are some uh, people that want to come and do uh, a craft here. And it's just, and it's not that the space is closed for them, the space is open for everyone, but if they can explain what the purpose is and you can make it tied to your mission, it will be a bigger learning and a better experience than just doing a craft because it's something it occurred to me and I like. If it doesn't have a mission behind, it's very hard to make it meaningful. And then you're just using material for using it. Uh, then we start with the planning and design. And this is where we wrote exactly what we wanted for the space. The plan for the school is four maker spaces. Right now we have two. Uh, and this is like how it looks. I just put it here so I can remember to go, but we started working with some prices with the general information, with the types of activities, what kind of activities are gonna be open or closed? Are they gonna do all the same? Are they gonna do their own thing? Which types of tools? Who is gonna be there? What type, of, what type of space? If it's gonna be a permanent space that stays there all the time, or is it gonna be a traveling truck? Because we also have a steam truck that travels, but that's a project we have with the university. Uh, and we want to create a micro truck that goes to the countryside, but that's coming soon. I'm going to show you the plans on that. Uh, we want uh, to get there, but what, what type of, of space it is? And this is the one we already have, but we did one plan for our middle school. And this is the design, again, the description. We did one for elementary and for ECE. And this is the one that changes a little bit because this is just a truck with uh, engineering toys. Uh, and it's amazing to see what kids come up with in this case. My vision or my idea was, uh, okay, let's think about a kid in the early learning and that kid being under the sun in a hot day, right? And then that kid starts thinking like, what do I need? Maybe I need a fan. So he starts like tinkering and playing with the toys or making a tent or something like that. And then when that kid moves to elementary, it, uh, the kid can be able to build a stand that stays still without any support. So they're using the analog tools to build stuff. In middle school, when they grow, they can do uh, some coding, some sensors, servo motors, so they can know how to automate those things. And in high school, that kid will be able to do his or her fan because he has the tools that needs that was that learned since he was little. Okay, so that kid can 3D print the pieces, program them, build it, and even sell it if we provide entrepreneurship uh, training. So our purpose is to give the kid or to meet the user where it, where it is and then helping them grow. And that's why I thought of four. Right now we have high school and middle school. Next year, I'm going to do this one. This is a growing project. As I said, this is something very dynamic and it, it flows and we have to respect the timing where it flows. This is again what I show you about the open and close types of activities, type of space. If you need electricity or not, because some uh, maker spaces don't need electricity because you won't use um, electrical equipment and that's okay. The one we're planning for the countryside won't have electricity because first of all, they don't have electricity there. 
So everything is manpower. So they will use bikes. Uh, they're, they're even using cows, you know, to make, to move stuff. It's, it's amazing. It's really a, a very interesting experience. Then we go to the budgeting and funding. We spread the word, but with the mission, with the need, uh, we classify our needs here. I'm gonna again share this slide so you can see the prices of everything, uh, how we defined what was equipment, furniture, supplies. There's a virtual tour we made for to spread the word and we got donations. Uh, the first community that believed in us was the Korean Parents Association. Uh, they said like, okay, we believe in this. We want this for the school. Uh, what do you need? I was like, uh, can I have 3D printers? I said, like, can I have a 3D printer? And they said, like, how many? And I was like, four. And they said, like, okay, and you're getting 10 iPads too. And I was like, perfect. So once they believed in me, uh, I did all the marketing strategy. I was not very good at that, but I, it turns out I am. So I put, like, thank you, Korean Parent Association, everywhere. So all the other nationalities uh, of the school wanted to be represented. So um, we had the Guatemalan Parent Association, of course. We had the Mexicans, the Venezuelans. They were like, how can we help? What can we bring? Like, we want our name in that board. We want our name represented. So you make it a community thing. And it's not only that they donate the things, we invite them to use them. Uh, you invite them to come, you give them a little workshop, they get to print their first, you know, uh, keychain that's with their country flag. And they're so excited because that's something they helped building. It was for make your education, and I am a lot of I, I run I write really I really like to focus on one thing. My goal was for make your ed and digital skills, and it turned out to be a really uh, good tool for community strengthening. So it it, it it's actually uh, better than what I expected. So then we started implementing. These are some pictures you're gonna see. Uh, I'm gonna show you with my computer uh, in a few minutes, but this is the most organized you're gonna see it. It was recently cleaned. <laughs> I'm gonna show you my computer and you're gonna be like, that's not the space. Yes, it is, but it's been used every day, all the time. There's no way I could like organize it again as it was as pretty as this one. But yeah, we have our green screens. We have we have a divide. And if you see this, the little stickers here, I might show you. These stickers belong to the colors, like this one in the corner, to our curriculum. There is a pink, there's a red, there is a green. Those are our strengths. That was our mission. So for example, I know that everything that's green, it's physical technology. And even all my equipment is tagged with a physical technology sticker because it's tied to the curriculum that we designed. So it's not that we decided just to buy a laser cutter. That laser cutter, it was bought because it responds to the need that we had before. So everything is tied, everything is connected. Some of them have two or more stickers because, for example, the green screen and the cameras and the iPads and Apple pencils, they are physical technology, but they're used for media and design. So they have the two stickers. So here, uh, yeah, what you're going to see when I'm going to show you what, with my computer, I'm not going to talk a lot because there's people using it, but we have uh, 3D printers, laser cutters, heat press to do t-shirts, precision cutter to cut the stickers and different materials, um, and other type of small tools like hammers, saws, chainsaws, um, bolts, nuts, all the things that, that you can think of. We even have some food. We have oil, we have vinegar, uh, we have flour. Uh, rice, you always need rice in a maker space. I can't like, yes, rice. Uh, we have regular printers, we have pencils, markers, uh, paper, whiteboards. Uh, that's, we have everything that we think the student needs. And if we don't have it, they have two weeks to order it and we can bring it to them. Unless it's a very expensive equipment, we will need like extra permission, but uh, if not, we can get it very quick. How else, it was not just about buying it. We had to uh, label each of them, each one of them, and then we put the instructions. It's very important that you put the instructions to use. Uh, the system that we use is that if you wanna use them, for example, if you wanna use it on, on Tuesday, maybe you can come on Monday for an hour. In one hour, you're gonna receive the training on the machine you're gonna use by yourself on Tuesday. So you are not dependent on us. 
you can do your own project and we don't inter we, there's no intermission with our uh, with our with with your project we don't want to tell you how to do your thing we just want to show you how to use the machine and once you already know you get a little sticker you have your password right and then if you want to come to use the fab lab and you need to use the 3d printer and you already got the training you just show me the sticker in your passport and then you come use it because i know you can use it there's always someone here for safety but this is not a class that we teach like hello welcome to your fab lab class let me teach you today uh how to work with wood no here you come uh whenever you have the need and you need to have your training before but if you get your training of everything you can just come and use it it's uh, it's the system that worked for us. We have also visual guides and we have a schedule so you can book each of, of the rooms if you need it. Uh, the space is quite big so we can have more than one a group doing different things and there's always an individual student working on a passion project uh, that's something that's related to, to their class. Uh, here are some examples. Here is the the pin, when you get the pin, means you're part of the community because you have had your uh, your training, because you have come here a couple of times, because you bring recycling materials. It's it's fun to see the kids with the huge trash bags and they're like, I'm going to the fab lab. I'm gonna get my pin on recycling, right? And, and then we received everything. Uh, sometimes they bring beer cans and we're like, oh no, uh, okay, we need the cans, but like parents, please don't send the beer cans. Uh, and if you can see, we have people from all ages. Uh, we have kids working by themselves. You don't see a teacher around. They already know how to use it. They do it. We take pictures. We take a lot of pictures of everything. We paste them on our wall so they can see themselves. Also, they're the things they create. For example, they did some stickers with the precision cutter and you can see them above my head. We paste them on the ceiling so when they come, they check if their sticker is still there and they feel they belong. It's not what you can take from the fab lab, it's what you can bring to the fab lab and, what, and what stays there. So they know, and each of the kids that did the sticker know, knows that there is a part of them here. So when they come, they feel they belong. There are like more pictures. Everybody wants a picture with our amazing. Uh, a thing at the at the front right it's uh it's lead and glass it's the most dangerous thing here at school but they they allowed it so I'm here that even the tables the tables were gray they were boring and the art teacher was like oh let us decorate I'm, I'm teaching stencils in my art class so I want the kids to to decorate the table so they did and some of the structures for the lights of the green screen were made with pvc pipes by the kids so it's their problem and they're building it if you get the community involved in building it, they maintain it. If you just buy the things, leave them there and, and go away, nobody's gonna get maintenance because they won't feel the belonging. Even if you assign somebody, it's not they're not gonna be part of it. But uh, the kids that did the, the light structure, they come and check them. They're like, oh, I wanna see if I work. Uh, if it worked, if I it need maintenance, if I have to do another one. So it becomes their space, not just mine. It's not my equipment, it's there, so they take care of it. And that's something that's a big lesson that we learned. So um, we have destruction tables too. Not everything is built. You sometimes need to destroy things to see how they're done. This was our greatest hit because you can't imagine how many kids are interested to break a computer. They are interested, they love it. So uh, yeah, so even parents bring their old computers they don't use and we get to open them, we get to check them out uh, and they get to research which of the parts is what and what can they mix. Uh, so most, most of the time they won't work if you try to reuse them because they are old and they're broken, but it's a really good experience. So to connect this um, makerspace experience with what we've been doing with the community this year, we started one big project and we're collaborating with La Ruta Maya Foundation, which is a foundation that rescues Mayan artifacts. Uh, they, the, the artifacts uh, were stolen or they were sold. So they're bringing them back to the country, but they have 
like 4,000 artifacts in one storage room. They don't have a museum and they don't share that knowledge with anybody. So we made uh, a collaboration. We brought 70 artifacts to school and for being in display. And we designed like more than 50 projects uh, in all the classes. So little kids are doing replicas. Some kids are scanning in 3D. Uh, we're bringing the blind school, the blind kids school. So they're gonna touch the artifacts with the, that, that were done in 3D. And they're gonna hear the sounds that were recorded. And also we translated the information of each of the artifacts in braille so they can read it. Uh, and those are like little projects. So for example, I'm gonna go to the, this was made by a student. It's just a Google site, right? And they use what they learn in their tech class of, of doing a Google site. And they created the digital, this digital exhibition. This is uh, one of the group of kids. They're building an artisanal kiln in campus. So uh, it's for um, working with clay, but also uh, they're excited because they might be able to do some pizzas and cakes there because it's a kiln, right? You, you can like, it has a lot of usages. Uh, here they put the collection again this was made by an eighth grader so we're talking about 14 years old uh, we took pictures of each of the artifacts and if you go to one of them you can see the information this information was given to us in an index card in paper and with very with a lot of archaeological uh, concepts and terms so the kids read them and they translated it from kids two kids, because the idea is that this exhibition travels to the countryside with all the projects, with all the, the games they created, the bingos, they did also uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, prompts, and they did augmented reality games. When you scan it, you can get the questions and you can compete. So here is the picture, and this is the 3D scanner. So you can check it out. This week, they're gonna be working on adding the sound to this site. And this is going to be a project called a museum in your pocket. So anybody who has a phone with uh, internet access can have access to the museum in their pockets, right? The sound, the information, the images. So this is, this is what they've been working on. Um, for example, here we have some, uh, these are the 3D printed uh, artifacts. So the game with the little kids was like, get your artifact and find it in the exhibition. So they were very happy. Uh, this is where they got it, right? And each of them has one. This was designed for the kids from the blind school, but we started, this is also inclusive for our little kids because they don't really reach to see their, their artifacts, they're small. So here's, they're talking about it. In the back, you can see the, the black things where the real pieces are. So, They're even creating conversations, making the sound because these are all uh, musical instruments. He's playing the flute. That's why he's putting it in his mouth. It's not uh, the actual sound of the of the exhibition, but that's how it's it's he's making up the sound. Okay, so I'm gonna see. I don't think. Well, this is what I explained about the projects. This is a video, maybe a caddy can share this later because this is a video that the students, or maybe, a, a, can you hear the videos? Yes? Or no? Yeah? Okay, so let's just. Uh, All right. No, we don't have the sound. No? Yeah, okay, then maybe you can share this later because this is where they explain so i don't think it's okay and then we have our feedback ecosystem in a whiteboard we maintain a lot of post-it notes and markers because we want to know what the kids are working on or need help with or want to work on so if i am working on a structure and it's not working out i'm gonna put a post-it note maybe somebody will see it and somebody will help me and that's where you create collaboration and support from big students to little students. And at first you're like, okay, little students get stuck and then they help from their bigger peers. But it turns out sometimes it's the other way around. 
maybe a little kid has a better approach to something that a big kid is already stuck in. So that's that's how we collaborate. So now um, coming soon, we're gonna do this projects, but in the schools in the countryside. So that's what I was mentioning. I still don't have pictures of the things we're building because we're doing them outside, but we want these kids with little or no resources to have access to a major education with what they have. And we're starting with collaborating with their communities. We got a hold of their community leader, which is interesting how the, the hierarchy there works. They have a community leader, which is the one that has the stick. And if you talk to the person with the stick, you're gonna get to do it. So we got people with sticks from different uh, places. We're starting in Alta Vera Paz. It's, that's gonna be like our innovation island, which means we're starting there and we're, we're seeing how it, it works out and then we move. And whenever we finish talking with that person with the stick, uh, he's gonna let us know how to proceed. So before, uh, before my time is up, I'm gonna go to the other room. I'm gonna show you with my computer what's happening. Um, you can you can say stuff. Uh, they won't hear you because I have the headphones. But let's, let's see. Uh, so here, as I told you, it's a very messy space. I'm by myself in one room, but I want you to see what they're doing. Just a little bit of context, or maybe I'm just gonna interrupt one of the kids to tell me what's going on. Right. So if you can see here, they're working with clay. Hello. Hello. Hi, guys. Marisol, do you want to explain what you're doing? Can you okay. Just... Yeah. Okay. What are you doing here? Hi. So we're making figures that have to do with what we're learning from the museum. So we're making them out of clay to kind of like replicate the style that is in the museum. And we're also going to write poems in our Spanish class that have to do with the pieces as well. So, yeah. Is that, is that yours? No, that's not Okay, mine. okay. Thank you. All right. Put on my Sorry, it's very messy. But... Um, okay, wait. So here is our tech. Uh, teacher, and he is uh, working on something. He's working on something. I'm working on a four-station rotation with four stations. He's working in a four-station rotation. So he brings his kids to try uh, four different things on the makerspace so they learn how to use it. And this is the hour training that I'm telling you. So after they receive the training with him, they can come by themselves. Uh -huh. So they are cutting CNC Peppa Pig. Of course, they're teenagers, so that's the kind of um, designs they love doing. But yeah, by his brother. So uh, we have the team that he's working with here. Here we have our 3D printers, two of our 3D printers. I'm going to take this with me. I'm going to explain to you what this is. But yeah, this is the other part of our space. We also have in the outside part of the room and our, the artisanal kiln. Uh, I was walking on campus and I got changed of rotor, so yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, so let me show you. This is the kiln I'm talking about. So um, if you see, it was like, a, this was a mountain, so the kids cut it, and now they're building the oven here. This is something they did yesterday. The, they put more bricks on top so they didn't fall. And it took um, a lot of tries to, to make it stick. So we had to ask somebody. We had to go to their parents, to their friends, to the person that helps them build stuff and see and ask questions. How do we do this? This is not working or this is working. Uh, what's the depth of the thing we have to build? Here is the, the wheel of the bike that they put cement on. So uh, that way you won't have to be biking all the time when you're using the pottery wheel. And so it's important that 
a make space also has a place to be extra messy, which in our case is outside. We use the cement. We are using uh, clay. We use a lot of water. Uh, we have kids from, let's say, eighth grade to, to 11th grade working here. So that uh, we can say like 14 years old to 17 years old. And they get along. They uh, share the idea. Sometimes they fight. And sometimes parents just come and say like, oh, today I was around and I want to help with the building. So they come and they work together. And it's, uh, it's been a great opportunity to collaborate with everybody. We had the little kids dino club because they said they were experts in digging. So they helped digging and it was, it was quite fun. So uh, I think that that's it. That's what I wanted to share. Uh, with you, I don't know if you have questions. I'm gonna stay around here because I don't want to get disconnected again. And we're gonna go back to my office, but uh, yeah, I can hear you perfectly fine. Okay, well, wow. Um, <laughs> Jesus, uh, thank you, first of all. That was amazing, um, very amazing. So I don't know, like, should we just do a small round and give some feedback and see questions that we're having and maybe um, then Erica, we can talk a little bit more about what are the challenges that you're facing? What are we facing? I mean, you talked a little bit about what your visions are, but uh, maybe we could just like do a small round and just, you know, what are your initial thoughts of, uh, seeing what you just saw. That was amazing. Thank you so much. I mean, even seeing this in action is obviously very mm -hmm. valuable. Um, anyone wants to say something, give some feedback? Everyone's overwhelmed over here. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so yeah. amazing to see and to, to hear also your explanations of why you're doing the things you're doing. Uh, uh, just the the whole like i don't know five or seven steps um that you presented it was super impressive yeah and i was wondering if there's even like several schools using this um like a uh, big spreadsheet that you created or whether this was just for yourself um yeah yeah we created i created this for our school but then last year and this year we were able to share it with Tri Association, which is the International Schools of Latin America. And we have been supporting these seven other schools with their designs. So uh, we're spreading. Before our spring break here, I had another chance to share it. So I'm hoping that there are more collaborations arising from them. So yeah, we collaborate with other schools in South America, Central and the islands. Super cool. Yeah. It's, it's, Thank it's, you. We are cool. We are very cool. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. And thank you for, for your insights. I, for me, it was very impressive that you or your, your team um, tried so hard to really to merge us with the school system and with the competence. Uh, structure and then you have also faced the, the international standards it was very impressive for me and so uh, yeah obviously you had really success uh, by via funding and um, yeah touching the, the parents and the different communities in your school or different nationalities and they I mean they are looking for of, for the standards that, that's what I um, what came up and um, yeah this is um, uh, yeah what I uh, saw here in Germany going was sometimes very hard the formal and the, the non-formal education sector when they come together and it's all very complicated and um, yeah it's, it's a kind of a struggle that uh, that these different mindsets uh, come come together in a good way and we, we have to translate like you did in this amazing excel sheet and the charts so yeah it's very interesting 
did you face uh, any uh, resistance when you created it um, regarding what Christina just said that um, coming coming with really new methods and very unusual methods into a an education system that is obviously advanced but still it's you know it's a formal education system so what was that or was everyone just like welcome let's do it we're gonna yeah. be with you what, what was there was there any resistance there was there was uh not from parents or from leaders but from teachers mm -hmm. because they have they're worried about not having the time to cover their contents or to cover the standards or to reach their learning goals. So it was just about having them play first, get like the person that resists, come and try it by themselves, and then guiding them through those uh, questions of reflection to show them that they actually learned more and reach further than what they would have done inside of the traditional setting. Mm -hmm. uh, that was like, that's the strategy we use with teachers and it happens every year. And it happens every time. Uh, yeah, again, um, thankfully, the, the, the least resistance is students, they love it there. And then there's that pressure. For example, if they use the Fab Lab in grade one, when they get to grade two, they ask their teachers, like, in which unit are we going to the Fab Lab? So the teachers awesome. has to come and, and talk to me and they're like, okay, my kids already know how to do this. How are we going to collaborate? Because I want them happy and I want them learning. Um, but yeah, you can reduce resistance by having your goals clear and then uh, knowing what you want. You can sit with anybody and say like, this is what you want. What is what you want? This is what I want. What is it what you want and need? And how can we help each other achieve each other's goals? And sometimes um, uh, it, it requires extra thinking, but... Uh, yeah, that's that's the most resistant I can think of that we got. And uh, I have a question because you talked about the teachers and um, how do you include the teachers when the kids come to the fab lab because they don't uh, they normally don't uh, teach the making um, hands on uh, method, uh, so they are like. Uh, like uh, students again so uh, yeah yeah that's exactly what makes it strong they're students <laughs> so they, they get to play they get to make public mistakes and have fun with them when they want because some of them feel really insecure and they would really like to know before they come with the kids so we we, we bring them before we, we give them a time where they can come try things by themselves and a strategy I use with them is that let's say that they want to do, they want to use the 3D printer for a project. So when they come, I teach them how to use the 3D printer, but also a laser cutter and also, a, let's say, the green screen. So they have options to choose in, in, in case they change their mind. But for me, it's just uh, getting them to know more things besides. So uh, they get to be the students. They get to have a safe space to learn. And that helps better than just sending their students because when their students find an obstacle they can say like oh you know what that happened to me when I did it too <laughs> and I solved it this way so they get to relate to the students learning curve so yeah we make them students again and we're actually everybody's learning all the time I'm, I'm also a student when there's a new machine and I get to play <laughs> and I mess up and I burned a lot of I mean the laser <laughs> cutter was one of the greatest ones I you can't imagine how many how much wood I wasted but i learned and now i can do like pretty cool designs yeah yeah i think a, um, a big point is that um you have to um get used to the failure or that that's a part of the learning and um that's in i think in germany in the school system it doesn't exist that you embrace that you have failed um and learn something about it or uh, just, yeah, have another process or another way. Um, yeah, I think that's very cool. Thank you. With that failure, I, I say this, and this is something that they say is my creed because it's my religion. 
But the only way to have a bad idea is to have only one. So the only way to have a really like fail experience is to just have one experience. Okay, so if you want to succeed, you need to know that you're gonna have to try more than once. And if you get it the first time, you're very lucky, but it barely happens, right? I see a question from Ricardo. Do you have any activities to get children from outside school in vulnerable communities? Yes. Um, we're bringing, uh, with the museum, we're bringing kids from public schools. We have 400 kids confirmed already, and we're bringing them in groups of 100. We, the kids are gonna be working in the makerspace and in the museum with them. That's happening in May. We also have uh, the kids, again, from the blind schools and the deaf schools. We have been creating resources for them because we I also want the kids from this school to know that uh, there's a world out there and that this is not just for their entertainment but for helping others uh, and of course then the project of sending a ma making a maker space in the countryside but that's going slow because uh, there's a, like a lot of conversation to to be done and then meeting the people getting the space uh, funding it's it's a challenge but it's not a problem because once you have everything clear it's it's just to find people that believe the same things that you believe that's another question um do you have uh, some special overall goals or let's say a code of conduct for the make space as besides uh, the school rules and uh, like some yeah some issues which crosses every project or behavior is like sustainability or anti-discriminatory <laughs> i don't know the word um so as a, i mean is so so that that you can focus or, or keep the focus on yeah the possibilities of of what's making all about so make the world a better place <laughs> let's say in general yeah we have our principles of learning uh which is the i think the second or third slide just the principles of making and tinkering and our code of conduct is the longest one. It has two words and it's be safe. And that's it. Uh, we have been doing this for three years now already and we haven't had an accident. Uh, I always tell the kids, um, if you don't think, if you think you shouldn't be doing that, don't do it, there's an adult around. We do manage to have a ratio of adults and children uh, if there are little kids, we have one adult per five children. Uh, if they're elementary and middle school, we have like one adult per 10 children. And in high school, again, one adult per five children because they, uh, yeah, they're more dangerous than the little kids, I'm telling you. But yeah, just be safe. Uh, that's the only thing, the only rule we have. We have a pasted, printed shirt everywhere. And yeah, that's the only rule we abide ourselves to. Uh, I have a ton of questions or comments, uh, I guess. Um, and another one, um, like just an observation, maybe um, that it's so nice to see um, that the kids are doing things that are making sense and not just uh, like the keychains are nice and they are like helping the community building. And I get that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you can all like print all those nice things uh, in the 3D printer to put in your shelf and stuff. But it's really cool to see that they're also doing so much, um, like guided by you uh, and the teams, uh, to really make a difference in the world as well uh, and to, to teach them in this direction. And um, yeah, we're, we're having this project that's called Critical Making, um, where we're seeing like, how can you teach kids uh, or how can you also um, have uh, other people like um, makers in Europe, mostly, <laughs> uh, make things that make more sense. 
like um, mm -hmm. if it's in the teaching here you have uh, so often like just the basic like make this 3d printed yoda head uh, that everybody's doing <laughs> yes and so we're trying to to, to help uh, a little bit in this direction to tell people hey make things that make sense if you do something like co-design it with the person that has the need uh, don't just like just because you have this uh, tool don't just make the uh, the things you can make with a tool, um, but, but speak to speak to the people and like build it together with them. And um, uh, currently, we're interviewing like people who are doing this kind of maker education all around the world from the Geek Network. Uh, and so Ricardo is doing that, and he is um, like. Yeah, having so many nice conversations that we're sharing currently um, in our blog, but also as like recordings of the conversations. And I wish Ricardo could speak himself, <laughs> maybe it's in another occasion. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the that's very challenging because uh, that's what makes the difference between a makerspace and a crafts room. In a crafts room, you just do crafts. If they don't need to make sense, you just play with it. Uh, I am a Star Wars fan myself, so I understand the Joda. And this is exactly what I was going to show you here. This is the half of a Darth Vader helmet. But uh, this was, and I'm not going to lie to you, this is, this was not, this, uh, of course, is just half of it. But this is not, um, it didn't start like a project. The kid wanted to print a life-size Darth Vader helmet. And I said, yes, of course. But then we started trying to think how can we integrate and who could we help so of course he had to design it in in 3d uh he used uh, open source program uh and also he used tinkercad which is free and then he started like asking people his dad is a doctor so he connected to the neurological hospital and then he designed one and donated it to a kid with hydrocephalus uh and then now he is in the entrepreneurship class talking with uh, business people to see who can replicate this and create more helmets, 3D printed helmets related to superheroes and uh, characters from the movies for these kids. Because he says like they're uncomfortable, that the, the helmets they have are uncomfortable and they're ugly. And not only you have hydrocephalus, but you have a helmet you don't relate to. And then he was taking time of class to do this so of course with the English teacher we we're like okay just read the book wonder uh, like do an analysis and connect it so it's about um, yeah sometimes he's going to start with something you like like Star Wars some other times he's going to start with the need like the blind kids uh, but if you get to have those like uh, that vision that you need to connect it with something um it always gonna have it always gonna have a meaning. So it, there's no like a, a very straight formula or what do you have to do first. Just make sure that it has all the elements to be a thoughtful and meaningful project. Uh, of course, I have this half here because we paste it with super glue and we didn't know that super glue it's plastic. Uh, we learned that, but now uh, but so but the final one that was donated it's actually pretty smooth and silky. You're officially nominated for Education Minister of the World. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> now it's just, uh, education should be fun, man. So my question is like, I mean, you already, you have a super designed curriculum and that's incredibly impressive. And you seem to have all your angles covered. But my question is still, has, has, there, so has there ever anything happened that was unexpected to you? I mean, probably all the time, but I'm meaning like, complete unexpected results that you hadn't planned out or mapped out or considered before. I, I mean, this is, maybe this is not the answer you were looking for, but almost every project, Katrin, like uh, the museum, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about uh, translating things to Braille, for example. And then we, we were there, we were translating things to Braille. And, um, but then when we were trying to translate, we couldn't find a font in the computer uh, that had Braille in Spanish, in Guatemala in Spanish with the special characters. So there we were creating a font, right? And, uh, and then uh, 
once we finished, we talked to the Committee of Blind People, National Committee of Blind People, and we showed them what we did, and they were like, what? Like, we've been looking for this. Uh, so there we were in the, in the community installing that font into their printers. So it's basically that. Uh, it's going to happen. It has to happen. You just need to be open, right? Uh, flexible, very, very flexible. Uh, I mean, and sometimes, I mean, I think I've, I've been very lucky that everything uh, has been a great opportunity for learning, or at least that's how we choose to see it, because we have had messes. And, and then at the end of the day, we always learn. So when we do the autopsy of the mess, uh, we realized that it was not a, a tragic death. It was a peaceful <laughs> one. Yeah. I see, I see a question from Ricardo about uh, gender balance in participants and what are gender balance actions? Uh, yes, at first, I think it's because, I don't know, uh, culturally, the engineers are guys, right? And then we have a lot of boys signing up, but I'm female, so there are like, there are a lot of girls too. Uh, so they're like, oh, Miss Erica is there. So, I mean, girls can do it. So I think the most powerful action into gender things is that I represent one uh, of the not very used, uh, only guys in engineering, but I'm also an engineer and I'm a female. And I, I'm young. And when we do uh, applications, because for example, for this project of the kiln, we couldn't have the whole school. So we sent an application letter and yeah, we had to like uh, in, involve girls, but it's we're creating a culture on it. So we every day is less the actions we have to make because uh, girls and ladies are more prompt to participate uh, in, in here. When we talk about other types of diversity, uh, we don't. That's something that I would like to work more but I can't because that's a hard conversation in the society and in the school in particular. So uh, we're getting there, it's a dream. But right now uh, I use what I have and I try to potentialize it. So in summary, we have a lot of girls in, in projects and doing stuff and being messy. We have a girls team club, so we can like call them and, and show them that too. That's so super cool. Mm -hmm. um, like just asking about another aspect um, that we're also always uh, allowing to work on about the sharing and about the open open source aspect. So you already said that you're using also open source software. Do you also have like a repository that is publicly available from the projects from the students? Like whenever yes. they choose to, to share? Yes, we we have a, a Padlet with a lot of things of open source uh, tools. Uh, yeah, and we do document each of the projects in one page project. That's something we call one page project. So uh, that's mostly for teachers, not for kids, but like, so the teacher can go to our intranet, which is a website we have at the whole school uh, internally, and they can see what projects have been done and maybe they want to replicate one of the projects for their class. Uh, and we have all the resources, everything is accessible. We do buy some programs uh, because we need to, uh, like for example, for the scanning of the artifacts, uh, the, we had to buy a lighter scanning app, but uh, only that we don't, we try not to uh, buy like very expensive apps if we can find an open source a tool because we want to replicate this in the in the countryside so it's all about making it accessible and if you buy a lot of apps at the end of the day uh, nobody will be able to do what you do because they might not have the money so we need to try to maintain the, the conditions uh, and the situations aligned yes totally understandable and uh, really nice Another shameless plug uh, from, from our community where uh, we have the carables.org uh, website, uh, or we have it, and it's, um, it's a platform where people are working on uh, healthcare and uh, co-designed uh, open hardware for healthcare, and it would be amazing to have these helmets uh, documented on it um, that you shared earlier, and 
like, yeah, I should send you the link. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you totally should. Yeah, we we love to collaborate. We love to add, and we get, uh, like during the pandemic, we got uh to collaborate with Education One Hundred, and then Hundred Ed, which is also an innovation agency. They made us ambassadors, and uh, they're from Finland and Estonia. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, they were great help. Uh, sometimes we receive more than we can give, but sometimes we can also give. And yeah.